There's no easy way to sugarcoat it. The U.S. healthcare system is broken. Healthcare is still a space where nurses in some sectors manually log patient notes on paper clipboards and fax over prescriptions. No one is driven to solve these problems and no one's incentivized to build for patients. And that's where Rose Changing the Game. Started in 2017, Rose a direct-to-patient healthcare startup. They started with men's health and women's health, but now they've branched out to mental health, fertility, metabolic health, and skin care. There is a Roe patient in nearly every single county in the United States, which is a big reason why Roe is now worth over $7 billion. Today, we're sitting down with Rob Schutz, Roe co-founder and chief growth officer. Rob is also one of the world's leading experts in growth and digital marketing. You're gonna to wanna to watch all the way to the end to learn his secrets. Let's get started. Rob, thanks a lot for joining us today on the channel. I know we were hoping this was going to be in person, but unfortunately, I was uh, just tested positive this morning. You know, I'm on day seven or so, and mm. uh, I got to tell you, your row antigen tests have really come in handy for our family. Hey, well, you know, I'm glad we could provide value to our shareholders, Gary. <laughs> <laughs> well, hope you're feeling better. Thank you, man. Feeling, uh, you know, a little better getting there, so... But before we talk about Ro, I'd love to hear about how you got started in tech earlier. I mean, Bark was one of the huge successes in terms of being able to build a consumer brand really from scratch, um, especially using your background in understanding digital ads. Talk yeah. to me about like going from zero to $100 million a year in revenue in 18 months, which is yeah. a crazy story. Yeah, I mean, a lot of great stories about Bark. I'd be happy to share. Maybe for context, I'll give you a little bit of a lead up to that because I, I started um, out of school doing healthcare technology consulting. So we actually helped hospitals go paperless uh, as, as they were moving into the kind of this digital EMR world. They still had these like warehouses filled with paper. Uh, so we would actually help go in, install the systems, and scan uh, like scan all of their old paper uh, to interface. And I did that for about five years. It was exciting for a while, kind of was looking for something new. And I wound up starting a daily deal company while I was still uh, doing consulting. Back when daily deals were, were super hot, uh, Groupon had launched, Living Social actually launched the same, same weekend. So we, uh, and I say we, it was me and $20,000 from my parents, uh, but wound up launching a company that was called What's the Deal? And really was kind of my first foray into like startups and digital and how the internet really worked. So got an opportunity to build that for a few years. And then when the market got very hot, I uh, realized I didn't really know what I was doing. I didn't really know how we we're gonna expand. Was it gonna raise money? Were we gonna hire a bunch of people? We had a few people at the time and wound up just selling to a competitor kind of at its peak. So I got very, very fortunate there. And then I, I was kind of trying to figure out what came next from there and uh, realized that I could talk to a lot of great people, but I was not really landing a, a gig that I thought was all that exciting. And healthcare was very much a common denominator for us. And as we looked through the industry and where to start, we, we really wanted to build a, a, a big healthcare company that where we could be very flexible on how we got there, but very firm on what we wanted to build. It was off to the races after uh, after five years at Bark. Yeah, when we met you, it was pretty clear you guys had all of the different components needed and you were all really, really hyper complimentary. But you didn't have traction yet, I think, actually. It was like more that here's the direction we're going in and here's yeah. the yeah. sort of super awesome specialization and expertise that we have to go and actually break this market open. But it wasn't like, you know, here's the numbers and it's going up and to the right. Yeah, who needs numbers? Who needs numbers? <laughs> yeah, I mean, you know, part of what made the uh, opportunity really interesting was there was a there was barrier to entry, right? Like when I think when we started talking, we were still building out our first physical pharmacy location, and that's kind of part of a broader strategy we have around vertical integration and um, an approach we took right out of the gate, which is actually pretty unique for Row uh, versus others in the space. We were still very early. We were kind of getting things up and running. We had to understand um, how provider networks would come together, how we would handle pharmacy and fulfillment. Um, so yes, it was very early, but 
I mean, for me, that was a, an exciting part of working with Zian Sama was just the complementary skills. And I think one of the honestly big lessons that I've learned is just the power of complementary co-founders and how that unique combination of skills, if they overlap too much, if the, if the Venn diagrams overlap too much, you're over-indexing your time on one area and there's like 10,000 things to do. Uh, you can't hire experts on everything. So the broader that set of skills are at the founder level, I think the, the better off you are at the early stages because you can just do a lot of the things. Yeah, my, uh, my friend Elad Gill was just saying, um, I hadn't heard him say this before, early stage, you have two jobs. One is find product market fit, and two is uh, don't fight with your co-founders. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's true. Uh, that's true. And sometimes one is harder than the other. I mean, oh, for sure. <laughs> from a co-founder perspective, we actually sat down very early on before we decided to, uh, to kick the company off. And uh, we kind of went through this exercise that I forced on, on Z and Saman of like, hey, if we want to do this, let's spend a day like actually telling our backstories to each other. Like, tell me about your life, tell me about your family, tell me about what's motivating for you. Because for, for us, it was really important that we were all sharing a common set of values and we wanted the same things. We wanted to build the same type of company because a lot of times, unless you go to that level of depth, like y you wind up having dissonance later in the, in the company's life cycle. And we just want to make sure like more than anything, we're building out of a foundation of like friendship and common understanding because you will inevitably need to lean on that uh, as, as you go through highs and lows of building a company. That makes sense to me. How did you guys think about, you know, obviously, you know, delivering healthcare period is really complicated and there are just so many parts. At some point, you know, you had to real you started realizing you sort of need to be a little bit more like Amazon where, you know, rather than try to integrate these sort of different parts, you're just going to actually have to build the pieces from the bottom up. I mean, yeah. SpaceX had to do that, Tesla had to do that, and Roe is having to do that. Yeah. When, how did you discover that? Yeah, I, I mean, I think that Amazon analogy is interesting because we took a similar early approach, which is we wanted to have a very narrow focus and go very deep. So when we launched, you know, Amazon launched with books, we launched with just men's health under one, one brand, but we used that opportunity and like built those reps in order to build out all the rest of the vertically integrated uh, platform. So, you know, we, we built out a national digital doctor's office that's licensed across all 50 states of uh, salaried providers, uh, which is very different than, than, than competitors in the space. Uh, we, we've also built out a, you know, national pharmacy network. It's licensed uh, across all 50 states. We have 10 physical pharmacy locations. We're one of the largest uh, physical pharmacy providers in the country. Um, and that uh, breadth actually allows us to deliver 98% of patients uh, uh, through two-day shipping and up to 40% with overnight, all without putting a package on the plane. So all ground, meaning it's just cheaper and faster for patients. And then additionally, over the years, like because we've been able to build reps with, with additional um, products and services that we launch on top of that infrastructure, we now have a, you know, an in-home care platform that allows us to send uh, you know, a nurse or a phlebotomist to take vitals, to take uh, blood, to distribute vaccines. Uh, we ran a vaccine drive with the Department of Health in New York State uh, the, towards the beginning of last year to actually vaccinate homebound seniors, uh, really showing the power of the in-home platform. Incredible. And then we also, through uh, acquisition, uh, we acquired a company called uh, Kit, kit.com, last year out of SF. Team is fantastic. Um, but we now have a CLIA certified and CAP accredited uh, lab, um, a series of labs uh, across the country that allow us to essentially ship someone a medical checkup in a box. You could take spit, you can take uh, blood pressure, you can self-administer blood, ship that back uh, to the lab, and then it will upload to a patient chart so they can view the results. So I would say similar approach in that we started with the focus being very narrow and deep that allowed us to go build like an amazing patient experience. And then from there, then use that infrastructure to be able to launch more and more on top of it over time. That's amazing. I mean, I think it's sort of astonishing when you take a step back to realize how much money like healthcare absorbs of, you know, annual GDP worldwide and especially in the United States. I mean, obviously we do have a fantastic healthcare system, but when you dig in a little bit, you realize, oh, like how much of it is going to clerical or managerial or sometimes like maybe offices you don't need, maybe giant buildings you don't need. 
IT systems that don't actually work. And when you add it all up, you know, that's where you can get an order of magnitude sort of savings. And, you know, all of that can actually go to doctors or nurses or care instead of things that are not that. Yeah. Or just go back to reducing costs for patients, right? If you can bring down those costs, you can actually pass that on to patients and let them, let them actually save. And yes, to your point, healthcare is roughly 20% of the US GDP. It's a massive, massive uh, amount of money that's spent on healthcare. But that's why, you know, I think what we're building and <clears throat> we, you know, we've really started to be at the forefront of this new category that we're calling direct to uh, patient. So direct to patient is just as you were saying, like, how do you cut out some of these middlemen where they're continuing to just drive up costs? And direct to patient is very much about making patients customers. Customers that can vote with their wallet and kind of reward businesses or punish businesses based on their ability to provide value. And that's something that's uniquely different uh, about healthcare than most other industries. If you think about in your life, if you have a bad experience buying a pair of shoes online or, or in store, you will probably go somewhere else. You have choice. You get to vote with your wallet. That is not always the case. That's not normally the case in healthcare, right? If you had a bad experience, too bad. Your, your insurance company already has a relationship with XYZ provider, or you need to use this pharmacy, or you need to use these doctors that are in network. The incentives are just very skewed. And so direct to patient is really more uh, about putting patients back in control and letting them vote with money <laughs> on like the services that they actually want and to punish uh, actors that they, that they don't believe are providing that value. And so we, we like to say like, if you're not providing value to patients, you get voted off the island. That is what exists in every other industry. It is now starting to become more and more prevalent in healthcare, which is really exciting because it means that with more competition, you can drive down costs, you can have better access, and patients actually get to make those decisions. And with more competition, you should get overall better better service and access, which is which is really exciting. I mean, it's sort of amazing how, yeah, just <laughs> it's like how providers work and yeah, I think that they are actually reacting now, but you know, the, the reality is direct to patient is changing things for the better for everyone. And you know, any any change that providers have, I, I think that that's probably a good thing, actually. Yeah, and I know you've uh, even at the YC level, right? There's a lot of folks that are coming through with more of this direct to patient model, right? That are focused on cash pay, patients get to choose, right? Like not building and spending time and engineering hours on like coding for billing for insurance, spending it on building value for patients, right? Um, there's a whole whole host of crop, and we're almost like legacy uh, in this uh, environment now when you look at all the folks that are coming in through the accelerators in different areas, but it's really exciting to see uh, because I think in the end, the, the people that benefit the most are, are the patients. I think it's super exciting. I mean, we're definitely seeing things that are you know, selling in all sorts of ways. Like some are actually even selling through providers, some are th selling through value-based care, some are selling direct to patient and, you know, anything that gives people choice and has a high level of standard of care, that's what consumers and just like people like, you know, I, that's what I want. That's what I want for my parents, for my kids. You know, I think we all want this to have a, a better access to better healthcare through choices. Absolutely. So, you know, one of the things that uh, distinguishes how Roe really focuses on this is actually sort of uh, a jobs to be done approach. Can you tell me about that? And, you know, what what does that mean? Because that sounds like something that a lot of startups could be using. Jobs to be done is is really just this concept of you need to focus on what people actually want uh, and advertise to them that way and market to them that way. You know, when you think about some of the le even legacy telehealth companies, they've broadly speaking, taken a very broad approach to marketing where they say like, we wanna be your everything. We wanna be the doctor in your pocket. We're here where and when you need us. Like, you know, we're everything. Just take out your phone and download our app. And I think that actually causes confusion uh, for patients sometimes. They're like, cool, what do you do? Like, you do everything, what do you do? And, and they're like, we do everything, what do you want? And it's a little bit of this chicken and egg where it's like, okay, next time I have a UTI or a sinus infection, I'll try and remember to, to go to your website, right? Versus jobs to be done is this approach we've taken where we said like, 
you are probably waking up and you are anxious about these things, right? You're anxious about your hair is thinning and your wedding is coming up, or you're trying to lose weight so you can go play with your kids uh, at, at, like at baseball practice. Job to be done is advertising and talking about those specific conditions so that somebody, when they wake up in the morning, they're anxious about it and they might see your ad, they say, ooh, that's something I wanna get done right now. You start with what people actually want and then you're able to, over time, help them with things they need. And you do that by cutting out the friction between want and need. And the example I like to give is, you know, people very rarely will wake up in the morning and say like, my cholesterol really hurts. I need to deal with my cholesterol, right? They know that they should deal with their cholesterol. We all know that we should deal with our cholesterol, make sure it's, uh, it's uh, at, at proper levels. But generally the motivation is not there because friction is very high. And there's other things that hurt. There's other things that are going on with their body. But if we've been able to bring someone in, maybe, uh, maybe it's through hair, maybe it's through issues with eczema or acne uh, or weight management or fertility, whatever it might be. Once you have a relationship with that patient, a provider could say, hey, you know, you're a 45 year old man. I, I don't see any labs on here for you. Could I send someone to your house this weekend? Could I send you a kit so you could self-administer at home? What is convenient for you? And then we can hop back on next week and we can talk about what's going on. Maybe I can ship medication if you need it, or maybe I can send you to content. You've now made it one button that they have to push in order to be proactive. And it's, it's kind of that shift from reactive to proactive. You have to start reactively with what people want and what they're already thinking about. And then over time, you can move on to those other things through deeper and deeper relationships. And I think that's where jobs to be done and, and this, this concept of direct to patient really intersect. Like direct to patient means starting with things they actually care about and, and patients and are the customers and they get to decide if they want to spend money on those things. So yeah, jobs to be done is a very important way uh, that we've approached things. And that's why you've seen, you know, you might see a Roman ad during the World Series and you might see a, you know, modern fertility uh, influencer campaign on social, or you might see a New York Times article on Roe. Uh, we, we'll bring that more into the overall Roe ecosystem over the course of time, but it's really about these jobs to be done that we're talking to people about to get them into the ecosystem and actually help them with things they, they want. That makes sense. And then you can really sort of see it in the type of you know, new, new, I mean, ailments, disorders, like all of the different treatments that a person might need, like you're sort of seeing that, you know, start and then like, I mean, it sounds like land and expand to me <laughs> from yeah. like software, I mean, right? It's yeah, absolutely. It's, it's um, you know, one of the reasons the second condition we launched was smoking cessation. We started with uh, ED, the second condition we launched was smoking cessation because we learned through data uh, and through the providers that 14% of people coming out of the platform were heavy smokers and they could greatly benefit for many reasons, but also help uh, combat like the initial initial condition. So we get a lot of that type of input from patients and the data they're providing themselves. And then just you know working more with the teams and understanding how we can leverage this vertically integrated infrastructure. And particularly excited as we kind of marry like telehealth with in-home and at-home and labs and how those become very complementary. Uh, so I'm, ex I'm excited for what comes next. Sounds like it's working. I mean, you know, I think earlier you were mentioning, you know, one in five people who use Roe for, you know, they actually use it for at least two services or products. So, you know, that's really starting to show that this land and expand slash jobs to be done approach, you know, really could extend to all the things that um, a human being needs, like from when they're very young to much older. Yeah. Yeah, we want to make it seamless where regardless of where someone enters the ecosystem, they might enter through a mental health door, they might enter through a dermatology door, they might enter through a fertility door. We want to make it very easy so that when they go out into the hallway, they look around and they realize they're in the middle of a big digital hospital that can help them with all of these different things related to their health. And it's not starting over. You're not going to another company that's doing just this one thing. A good example is if someone is having, um, let's say they're having acne or they're taking um, custom RX uh, for, for skin care for dermatology purposes, uh, right now, if you go to a single uh, company that's just doing that, and then you go to a single company that's helping you with uh, fertility and trying to get pregnant, those don't talk to each other. We're in an ideal scenario, and what Ro is, is going to enable is someone uh, might be uh, getting custom skincare, and then they go and they take them on a fertility hormone test. They want to learn more about their fertility information and, and plan for the future. 
our providers can see that and technology can help automate a switch or a flag to say, hey, you should actually change your skincare routine because you shouldn't be using Tretinoa if you're trying to get pregnant. And so the interconnectivity of the human body makes like one single platform much more powerful in that you're going to be able to get better care overall and help someone take care of themselves holistically. It's always just such a pleasure to sit with you, Rob, just because uh, you're sort of one of the world's experts at growth and at digital marketing and at you know basically reaching out and getting people who need a thing and then giving them that thing that they want, actually. So it's really, really cool. One of the things you did recently that I super admire is um, you actually made a list of growth resources, didn't you? Yeah, yeah. It was, uh, seems like a simple task, but I would say a couple times a week I'll get outreach from investors or uh, companies that are starting out or others in the space that are just like, hey, do you know someone that does SEO work or you know someone that they can help with paid search uh, or someone who's like experimenting with TikTok ads. Uh, and I like to help be a connector, uh, but there's so many great people out there doing great things, it's hard to stay up to date. So I basically just open sourced a list and I said, put in your, you know, put in your information, uh, clients that you're working with, your experience, your specialties, and they kind of have like a an air table that has, I don't know, at this point. 200, 500, uh, I think over 500 entries with with different uh, vendors, contractors, and freelancers that are all kind of sorted and categorized. Powerful. So, yeah, it's been it's been helpful, and I um, I know that new folks. What did you call it again? Is it Rob's list? It's the growth list. <laughs> the but growth Rob's list. list. Rob's list can be good. I would love to meet Craig uh, at some point. But yeah, um, <laughs> definitely definitely a helpful resource. I've gone back to it a couple times. We'll uh, link to that in the description. But yeah, it's, please it's do. It's really an important resource. You might get a kick out of this. My wife actually used to work at a, um, a women's clothing uh, brand called BB. I think it was uh, you know, a Persian founder in the 70s out of the garment district in LA. And uh, the thing that he figured out that allowed him to build it into a, I think, multi-hundred million dollar a year business back in the 70s with really like hmm. no access to capital, uh, it was actually bus ads. So he discovered in LA in the 70s, you could buy bus ads for very, very cheap. It was a mispriced asset. Hmm. And so he could build a, um, a women's, uh, you know, sort of streetwear slash clubwear brand off of uh, buying very cheap ads that nobody else w were buying. And uh, that was the whole thing. Like he yeah. got distribution and, and, you know, it sort of reminds me of your story of working at, uh, you know, Bark sitting there trying to buy these sort of like sidebar right-hand side ads. I mean, people probably don't even remember what that, yeah. I remember what the that whipper was. Snappers. was before the newsfeed. The whippersnappers <laughs> wouldn't remember, but yeah, it was pre-feed. Totally, you're totally right. I mean, it's, it's all about trying to find uh, an edge uh, when it comes to like growth and when you're looking at channels. Like sometimes that could be being early to a channel. Sometimes it's finding a really creative application uh, of a channel or finding a way to grow organically in ways that other, other people aren't. Uh, but you're always looking to see if you can find some form of arbitrage or some edge on one of these channels. Sounds like bus ads might be something to revisit, by the way. I don't know if <laughs> that gap right. has closed over the last uh, 50 years. But yeah, absolutely. You kind of always have to have head on a swivel and be able to balance also like your core channels, like your search and your social and your things that you know are, are winners and you're just trying to continue to optimize those with the tests and the seeds that you're planning to say like, hey, when all that blends together, what do my numbers look like? How, how is the brand coming across? What does brand health look like? What does CAC look like? Kind of like balancing all of those factors as well. But I love it. That's a great anecdote. I feel like growth is one of those really tricky things in startup land because um, once you figure out something is working, you don't want anyone to know because the second you tell someone, it's going to stop working for you. <laughs> yeah, yeah. That's why, yeah, there's all these conferences and speaking opportunities. And I'm, I'm like, everyone just, everyone just, if we find something that's working, like keep it close to the vest. But I think in general, that's actually a really good point. It, it's something I think about from experience in the past too, even from Bark, which is like, when you find something that works, how valuable it can be to just lean into that instead of immediately trying to diversify and to find 10 things that work. If you're lucky enough to find one thing that's working well, it's a really, there's a really good argument you're just spending all of your time and resources on that. I remember Facebook was a, Facebook was a winner for us. And in my mind, I was like, 
check. I'm gonna move on, I'm gonna find the next winner, right? We should have three winners who are diversified. And I kind of spent years poking around, looking at other stuff, and in retrospect, should just spend all of my time and all of our money on, on a channel like Facebook, because it's never gonna be cheaper than it is right now. Um, and once you have an edge, you try and keep that as long as possible, because it, something that works today doesn't necessarily mean it's gonna work tomorrow, or next week, or next month. And so you really, you really want to take advantage if you've got a winner on your hands. Sounds like you have a principle around this called uh, paying. For, you have to pay for your education and growth. Mm. Yeah, pay for education is my fancy way of saying uh, it's okay to make. Uh, it's okay to take some swings uh, where, you, where where you don't make contact. Every time you're going out and you're trying a new channel or you're trying a new type of creative on a channel, like you're paying for that education. You you basically want to know should I do more of this or should I do less of this or stop doing this completely. You know, I like when we as a team are trying things and most of them don't work. Like if you work in growth and marketing, you know that a lot of times these swings aren't, aren't necessarily gonna pan out, but you have to be trying and you're paying for that education to say, all right, we tried this thing. It is so far away from being a potentially, you know, profitable or, you know, gross profit LTV um, calculation that makes sense for our business. I'm not gonna be able to optimize my way there. I'm gonna come back to that in a year or two years. You're, you would gladly a lot of times pay for that information up front so you can more tightly narrow your focus on where you're going to spend your time. You know, like I remember as uh, I was originally doing some tests on TV, there can be a tendency to wanna to kind of tiptoe your way into these channels and, and like I'll spend 25K, I'll spend 50K, and like it's it's a lot of money. It can be scary compared to sometimes what you're spending on digital channels. But unless you're actually paying to learn something, you're gonna keep coming back to that. And that's what I did is like, uh, every quarter, like we didn't really get a clean read, so we'll do another spot and we're gonna do another buy. You'd much rather just front load that and say, you know what, we gave it our best shot. It's not something that's gonna work right now. Let's go spend the time on these other things that are showing signs of life versus trying to spread the team too thin. So I'm a big fan of, of paying for education overall and just narrowing the focus for the team. That makes sense to me. And then when you find something that you learn and you paid for it already, then just keep doubling down into it until it doesn't work anymore. <laughs> That's right. And don't tell anyone. And don't go on a YouTube channel and tell everyone. <laughs> that's right. But uh, what you could do is <laughs> hire people in, and maybe that's actually uh, you know, a, a good place to go now. I mean, Roe continues to grow. It's you know, We're super proud to have been with you for so long since the, you know near the beginning. And Roe's hiring. So if you're watching right now and you want to learn... <laughs> Yes, and you want to learn and pay for some of that education, head to row.co backslash careers. It's a great way to look at uh, all open roles. And we're, uh, yeah, hiring, uh, always hiring on the tech side, uh, product, marketing, growth. Come, come take a look. I always learn so much when I get to hang out with you, man. And uh, I know we wish we, we'll have to do this again in person. Thank you so much for sharing your story and, you know, just a snapshot of where, you know, Roe is. I think it's just, it's just getting started from here. Yeah, very exciting. We're extremely appreciative of all of your support and initialized support throughout the years. Awesome. Thanks, Rob. All right. Thanks, Gary. Appreciate it.